Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my long-term review of the Fujifilm X100V, a camera that's become a bit of a modern classic, not to mention a regular companion on my own trips for several years now. I know there's a lot of Fuji fans here, so most of you will also be aware of the camera's notoriety, with a perfect storm of midlife popularity, global component shortage, and something to do with a pandemic, resulting in one of the hardest cameras to buy for some time. Demand well outstrips supply, and while the situation is improving, at the time that I made this video, the X100V remained backordered at many of the big retailers. So if you want one now, smaller stores will be your best bet. But you may want to hang on for a bit. As the X100V approaches its fourth birthday, a successor is inevitable, surely arriving sometime in 2024 and sporting one of Fujifilm's latest sensors. In fact, by the time you watch this video, a new model may even already be on sale and reviewed on this very channel. And once that happens, or if that happens, I will of course link to it here. And I'm not being coy, I genuinely don't have any information at the time I made this recording. And even if I did, I'd normally be bound to secrecy with an NDA. But with Fujifilm gradually updating their most popular models with the new sensors, the X100 is well overdue for some attention. But even with a successor in the wings, I think it's still worth talking about what makes the X100V special, why so many people love it, and equally talk about what it doesn't do quite so well, and why it, or indeed the series in general, may not be the right camera for you. Now, I originally reviewed the X100V when it first came out in early 2020, and thought it was the best in the series to date. I always enjoyed the concept, but found the lens in the older versions was a bit soft, especially at the closer distances and larger apertures that I'm personally fond of using. The X100V's updated lens greatly improved this, while also sporting the latest sensor, adding some weather sealing, and accommodating a tilting screen that was so flush to the body, the mechanism was almost invisible. As someone who personally enjoys fixed lens compacts and tries to travel as light as possible, I was tempted to get one for my own personal use, but was still drawn to the greater perceived flexibility of models like the Sony RX100 Mark VII. After all, the Sony is not only smaller, but packs an 8.3 times optically stabilized zoom, and a screen that can not only angle up, but all the way forward for those who want to vlog. Sure, the sensor is smaller, but few would argue that the Sony isn't better featured overall, and the prices are similar. But unless something really is going to be a tool to get a specific job done, you should really try and buy as much with your heart as your head. And the simple fact is, while the RX107 does tick all the boxes on specs, and did join me on several trips, I just didn't connect with it personally or enjoy using it that much. I can still recommend it as one of the best all-round pocket cameras, but it just didn't work out for me personally. So I decided to give the X100V another shot, and ended up enjoying it so much I've taken it on every single trip for the past two and a half years as my main travel camera. In fact, if you follow my Instagram account, at Camera Labs, you'll see my feed has mostly been from the X100V for several years now. So as I talk about the camera, I'll show you some of the photos that I've taken from those trips, and all a JPEG straight out of camera without any adjustment, unless otherwise mentioned. What I love about the X100V starts with its size. As I get older, I'm less inclined to travel with larger cameras and a selection of lenses, unless I'm shooting a special event that requires them. For my normal trips, I just want the smallest camera possible that will deliver the quality and control that I'm after. Now by that, I mean a noticeable step up over my phone or an action camera, because if it can't do that, what's the point? Now both the RX100 and X100 series will do that, as well as providing the viewfinders that I personally prefer to compose with. So what drew me to the Fujifilm over the Sony? Well, it's a number of factors, starting with the moment I take either camera out of my bag or pocket. The RX100 may be smaller, but I simply prefer the look and feel of the X100V. Now this is of course an entirely personal thing, but not only do I love the design of the X100V, it actually inspires me to take it out and shoot. It's one of those cameras you begin to enjoy as soon as you see it, and you also look forward to taking photos with it. This is an often overlooked aspect of any camera, as one may top the tests or have the best specs in its peer group, but if you don't actually enjoy or look forward to using it, you're not going to be getting much use out of it. And again, while the X100V is substantially larger and heavier than the RX100, it's crucially still small and light enough to be carried with you at all times. Indeed, to discourage me from looking around and necessary weight, my day pack is now a tiny shoulder bag from Eastpack, which has enough room in the main compartment for a half litre bottle of water and the X100V. 
In fact, I can also just about squeeze in a GoPro Hero under the X100V for vlogging or for really poor conditions. As a shoulder bag, the East Pack is not going to be as comfortable as a proper backpack, but at around one kilogram fully loaded with my camera and water, it's not putting much strain on my back. And crucially, like all shoulder bags, can also be carried on my front for security and easy access. And that access in turn means that you're not going to be missing any photo opportunities. Moving on to image quality, the X100V sports Fujifilm's fourth generation X Trans Sensor and Processor, delivering 26 megapixel photos with a choice of film simulations. Again, it's a personal choice, but I'm personally very satisfied with the output from Fujifilm's cameras with JPEGs that I'm happy to use without any further processing. If I want high contrast black and white, I choose Acros. If I'm after punchy saturation, it's time for Velvia. And for a muted retro look, maybe classic chrome or Astia if it's a portrait. But even the standard Provia simulation looks pretty good for most subjects. And if you shoot in RAW, you can easily make duplicate versions with different film simulations applied in playback. Of course, the same sensor and processing is available in many other Fujifilm cameras. So what makes the X100V different? It is, of course, the fixed lens. And this is a critical part of the X100 series as it is a fixed prime. Long ago, Fujifilm decided that a 35mm equivalent lens was the way to go for the X100 series, and this will either please or annoy you, depending on your preference on focal length and whether you're Chris Nichols. 35mm is undoubtedly a vanilla focal length, neither wide nor long, but if you have only one lens, it is the one that I would personally go for. It's wide enough for most landscapes, buildings and interiors, but it's also long enough for environmental portraits and arguably perfect for street photography. It's also wide enough to get away without any stabilization, at least for stills photography. If I want wider coverage, I either use the panorama mode or ideally take four or five shots in a row with the intention to later stitch them together in software. Tighter coverage is of course more of a challenge and I do occasionally find myself spotting a view that would look great with a short to medium telephoto. Now Fujifilm does offer lens converters which transform the coverage to roughly 28 or 50 mil equivalent but both greatly add to the bulk. And I think if you're going down that route, it just makes more sense to buy one of Fujifilm's smaller bodies with an interchangeable lens mount, at least unless you want to exploit that leaf shutter as well for faster flash syncs. So in the absence of optical conversion, the only way to achieve tighter coverage is of course a simple crop during which you will be losing quality very quickly. This is why a future body with perhaps the new 40 megapixel sensor could be really nice as it provides more latitude for cropping. But ultimately, if you do choose a fixed prime compact camera, this is the compromise that you need to deal with. But conversely, a fixed lens can actually be a benefit. Personally speaking, I like how they encourage me to explore more angles and positions, invariably giving a more interesting composition than if I'd just stood still and zoomed. Where the X100V's lens takes a lead over most phones and other compact cameras though is the f2 aperture coupled with that large-ish APS-C sensor, in turn allowing for some separation around subjects. Now we're not talking about total obliteration here, it can be quite a subtle effect, but on portraits taken from the waist or chest up you can achieve a little blurring in the background, and if you're able to exploit the minimum focusing distance to get closer to some details, you can enjoy satisfyingly shallow depth of field effects. I was never able to achieve any meaningful blurring from the RX107, so this is an important benefit of the X100V for me personally, and I don't actually yearn for anything more in this regard. As I mentioned earlier, the lens on the X100V is also pretty sharp, even at f2, and I personally prefer its results to the XF23 f2 on one of the interchangeable lens models. I do hope they update that lens. I was also surprised to find it could deliver reasonable looking star images if you point it up at the night sky. The corner sharpness does benefit from being closed to stop to f2.8, but the images remain reasonably clean even at high ISOs. That's the benefit of that bigger sensor. I also like the leaf shutter, and while I personally rarely exploit the fast flash sync capabilities, I do appreciate its quietness. This can be a very discreet camera in use. All right, that's enough of the love fest. What don't I like about the X100V, having used it as my main camera for the past few years? Well, maybe it's my fingers or grip, but every time I take it out of a bag, I always seem to have accidentally turned the EV dial or even powered it on by mistake. The sleep mode does take care of the power aspect, but I do have to check the dials before taking any photos to avoid unpleasant surprises. 
the compact battery inevitably means fairly modest battery life. And while I am willing to accept that for a camera of this size, I have found myself caught out by the camera's Wi-Fi gobbling it up while trying to connect and transfer images to my phone. To be fair, Fujifilm's app is gradually improving, but for me, it's still infuriatingly unreliable at making a connection and transferring images to my Android phone. It works maybe every fourth or fifth time for me personally, but each failed attempt gradually consumes more of the battery, especially if you have it set to transfer and power off. I found myself with a completely drained battery at times and only saved by a spare pack or an emergency top up over USB. So unless you have more luck than me, use the Wi-Fi with caution. As I mentioned earlier, the panorama mode is a great way to capture wider scenes, but I often have highly variable results from it with some ruined by multiple bands across the image, even when I've been careful to lock various settings. To be fair, this affects all Fujifilm cameras. I just wish they'd make it more reliable. It's also a little annoying to have a camera that's only weatherproof if you buy and attach an optional lens accessory. I appreciate the lens physically extends and having the accessory built into this version of it would make the camera thicker, but it would be nice to have a proper solution out of the box. That said, I've never owned any of these accessories nor had any issues with the bare camera body. And I realize this will be considered blasphemy by the X100V disciples, but I don't actually use the optical viewfinder. Now I've tested it in my reviews and appreciate the technology, but for my own personal use, I just use the electronic viewfinder mode. Don't hate me. As such, there's always this knowledge in the back of your mind that the camera includes an expensive feature that I rarely, if ever, use. It could be more affordable with an EVF only, but how many would this alienate or upset? Maybe Fujifilm should make two versions of the camera. Which brings me to possible upgrades for future models. What would I like to see going forward? Well, this is actually a tough one, as after 10 years of evolution, the X100V has actually got a great deal right. And while there are some obvious things that are missing, adding them could actually compromise the overall look, feel, and handling of the camera, not to mention its price. Most obviously, how about a zoom lens? It would give the X100 greater flexibility, but I wouldn't personally want it if it made the lens dimmer or softer or the camera larger and heavier. As I mentioned earlier, I'm quite fond of the purity of a fixed prime lens, but if the engineers can make a small, light and decent, say, 24-50 f2-2.8, I could be converted. Likewise for IBIS or optical stabilisation. I just don't need it for stills at 35mm equivalent, and while it is useful for video, you're unlikely to be hand-holding the camera at this focal length. Maybe a gyro could be fitted to implement digital image stabilisation for video, but again, it's not on my wish list. I've already mentioned the modest battery life, but again, I wouldn't want a longer life if it impacted the body size and weight. Same for a screen that could, say, angle forward for vlogging. Now, since the focal length rules out handheld work, you'll generally be filming from a tripod, so you could always use your phone or a separate monitor to preview the composition. And I also think if the vertical tilt mechanism was swapped for a side hinge, well, there'd be a riot at the house of photography. In terms of fixing what doesn't work well right now, I'd say full weather sealing without accessories, a reliable panorama mode, and a reliable phone app which really only leaves the sensor and processing, which on a future model will inevitably employ the latest parts. Assuming the lens can handle a high resolution sensor or is upgraded to do so, then the 40 megapixel X-Trans 5 will certainly provide more latitude for cropping. In fact, if cropping becomes integral to the operation, a future model could always have a slightly wider lens to start with, like maybe a 28 or even a 24 equivalent. So long as it could still give a decent result at 35 and ideally 50 equivalent, then I'd be very happy to have the option of wider native coverage for both stills and video. But that's it really. The X100V is already close to being my ideal travel camera. As I noted above, there are several ways it could be upgraded in terms of specification, but I wouldn't personally want anything that increased its size, weight or price. So would I still buy an X100V today? Well, even four years after launch, it remains the best choice for my own requirements, and I still think it's worth the original retail price, albeit not the jacked up figures that some have tried to scalp us for. But I would now wait at least until mid-2024 before buying one, as surely a successor will be announced by then, allowing you to decide which model is going to be best for you. But one thing has become very apparent over the last few years, the demand and love for the X100 series surely proves that there's a small but passionate market for fixed lens compacts. 
We're always told that phones have killed the compact market, but I still think there is demand for premium options at a more affordable price than say a Leica, and I'd love other manufacturers to revive their discontinued lines. How about successors to the Panasonic Lumix LX100? Or the Canon PowerShot G1X? And what about you, Sony? The RX107 is getting on for five years old now. Or how about if Nikon actually put the DL18-50 concept camera into production? And as for Fujifilm itself, what about a new version of the X70? I'd love to see them all back on the market. So how about you? Do you yearn for a high-end compact camera? How much would you be willing to pay and what would you want it to do? Are you one of the X100 faithful? In which case, what would you like to see on a future model? I'd love to hear from you in the comments. And as always, if you enjoy what I do here, I'd love it even more if you considered following my channel. Thank you very much. Oh, and Fujifilm fans might also enjoy my in-camera photography book, where around half of the images have taken with older X-mount cameras, all JPEGs out of camera. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.